Grace and peace to you and welcome to worship here at Trinity Presbyterian Church, whether you're watching us online or listening in on the radio. And if you're catching us on Sunday morning, I want to remind you that uh, this evening at 6.30, we'll have an outdoor in-person uh, congregational meeting and worship service. At the congregational meeting, we'll be voting to release our associate pastor, Chris Peters, as he uh, accepts a new call in Lincoln, Nebraska. And then in the worship time, he'll have one last chance to share with us. And then we'll also be recognizing a confirmation class. And so it should be a very special evening. And I hope that you can join us, weather permitting. And now let us worship God together with joy and gladness. Christians, let us worship God with a sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the invitation to know Christ, for the redemption that we have received in Christ, and for the spirit that guides our lives. With such gratitude, let us affirm God's care for us in all times, responsively reading words from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. As we prepare for a time of confession, I wanted to share that the past two weeks I've been meeting with confirmands and their mentors on Zoom, and it's been a beautiful time of talking about their faith. But one thing that I've heard several times from our youth is that they have learned and appreciate that as Presbyterians, we confess our sins together as the body of Christ. And on top of that, we don't just th confess the things that I have personally done wrong, but we confess the things that we do wrong as a body of people, recognizing that we fall short of God's vision for our lives as individuals and as communities as people and as societies, let us confess our sins together. God of mercy, we worship you for the grace you have shown us. 
Still, we are marked by sin in thought, word, or deed each day. We are marked by the sins of what we have done and what we have left undone. We have judged a neighbor because they didn't look like us. We have labeled strangers as outsiders because of where they were born. These are things we have done. We have not spoken up when a friend has made an insensitive joke. We have told ourselves that injustice and prejudice are not our problems. These are things we have left undone. Lord, forgive us. As we turn to you, send us back into the relationships of this life as people who seek to welcome, forgive, heal, and love. Amen. Trusting in the steadfast love of God, whose mercies are new every morning, every day, know that in Christ you are forgiven and be at peace, but also be encouraged to go forth in love. Amen. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. God is also strong, and He wants us to be strong. In fact, as we learned last week, He made us an armor of God. We have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Our sandals are to be ready to spread the gospel of peace. And of course, the shield of faith. Now, what is the shield of faith? Well, as you're going back to school, I know that when you feel down or when you maybe miss your friends, maybe you haven't been able to go back to the brick and mortar school, maybe you don't click with your teacher, maybe sometimes homework can feel overwhelming. That's when we raise the shield of faith and we say, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because God makes us strong. After the worship service today, read Ephesians 6.10 with your family. Talk to your children about how you've had to raise the shield of faith. When are there times that you've had to do that? And now let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word read and proclaimed. Let us pray. Holy One, you discomfort us at times with your word. As it shakes our expectations, rearranges our priorities, and causes us to live as a new creation. By your Spirit, encounter us with your holy discomforting today, that such an encounter might transform us for the first time or for the thousandth time. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you want to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and
time to time, you'll come across a passage in the Bible that's surprising, sometimes even a little shocking. You don't expect to read what you read. And that's especially true in today's text. And it's Jesus's words that have us scratching our heads. What he says is not, how should I say this, very Jesus-like. Our text this morning comes from Matthew chapter 15 and beginning at verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon, but he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet... Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, just a moment of truth here. How many of you think Jesus comes off a little rude in this story? I know you're not supposed to say that kind of thing, but doesn't it seem like he woke up on the wrong side of the bed or something? It's a hard text. But as I have studied this passage this week, I have really grown to appreciate it. It's a remarkable story. And so we're going to walk through it together. And I want to give credit to a Presbyterian author and theologian named Ken Bailey. Ken Bailey is kind of my go-to guy when I come across a text in the Bible that I'm not sure what to do with. He has a unique perspective on the scriptures, not only because he's a great New Testament scholar, but because he lived and taught in the Middle East for most of his life. And so he understands the context of the scriptures as well as anyone. There's something that we need to agree on as we get started, and that is Jesus was a master teacher. Uh, No matter what you think about his claims to be the Son of God, it is hard to deny that his ideas about life's meaning and purpose, about ethics and morality have stood the test of time. Jesus taught about life and faith like no one else has. And just as a side note, we've been thinking a lot about teachers in these past few weeks as we've been wrestling with how to open schools safely. And so I just want to say how grateful we are for our teachers. Every year we express our appreciation with the start of a new school year. But this year we do so especially as they put themselves at risk in order to do the important work they've been called to do. And so we just want to pause and express gratitude on behalf of our children and youth in the community. Um, Some of you will know that Trinity served lunch to the teachers at J. Larry Newton and Somerdale School. We've also helped with uh, the Fairhope Police Department back to school event last week. And we're going to continue to find ways to honor and to care for our teachers in special ways this year. You'll be hearing more about that um, in the future, along with ways that you can participate. Now, we've all had great teachers in our lives, teachers that have changed us somehow or helped us to see the world differently. A truly gifted teacher understands that lecture alone is often not enough to transform life. People need to experience truth. A skilled teacher is also able to instruct on more than one level uh, to more than one group of people. And the reason that I say that is that's part of what's going on here in Matthew 15. 
to understand this passage, we need to see that Jesus is speaking to two different groups, to the disciples and to the woman. He is testing their understanding about who God is and what it means to live in the reality of the kingdom. So let's see who aces the exam and who gets a failing grade. Jesus and his friends are in a region that's far north of where they usually are. We're told they're in the territory of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are Phoenician cities way up north on the Mediterranean coast. And you need to know this for the story. The Israelites hated these people. Josephus, who was a historian in the first century, said that the Israelites considered the people of Tyre and Sidon the most bitter of enemies. And just to give you a sense of this, a few chapters earlier in Matthew 11, Jesus is teaching one day and he says this, if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I tell you on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Now, why does Jesus mention Tyre and Sidon? Well, he is saying even the people that you think who are most wicked, even the people of Tyre and Sidon would have repented and turned from their sin if they had seen what you had seen. And the point of all this is that this woman would be regarded by the disciples as a member of the most immoral, depraved people they know. So she comes to Jesus as a nobody, as a spiritual zero. And we learn that this woman's daughter is suffering terribly. Her daughter has an unclean spirit and she comes asking for Jesus' help. She wants him to drive out the demon. But look how Jesus responds. He totally blows her off. Jesus says, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, these are some harsh words. And notice that the gospel writer doesn't try to sugarcoat anything. It's right there in our face. We're in an election year, and so we know how political campaigns will try to spin their message so that the candidate will look their best. Notice there is no attempt here to alter or shade what Jesus has said. Matthew is deliberately drawing our attention to it. Clearly, something is going on here. Matthew, of course, knows how this story will end up. We don't know that yet, and yet he wants us to struggle with that. Matthew wants us to live in this tension. He is doing this deliberately, on purpose. So what does Jesus mean when he says it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs? Well, the children stand for Israel and the dogs stand for Gentiles. In other words, this woman. Now, in ancient times, dogs were not generally considered pets as they are now. They were mostly scavengers and they were considered unclean. Jesus' words to her are, in effect, I was sent to Israel, and since you're an outsider, you're not part of my mission. I'm not here for you. I'm here for someone else. Now, why does Jesus say this? In a lot of other places, Jesus makes it clear that he has come, that the whole world might be saved, that no one should perish. Even In Matthew's gospel, in chapter 8, there is a Roman centurion who comes to Jesus with a request, and Jesus grants it. He heals the centurion's servant, and then he says, Truly I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus says in Luke's gospel that many will enter the kingdom of God. People will come from east and west and north and south and will eat in God's kingdom. And that phrase, east and west, is technical language that refers to people who didn't live in Israel, which means Gentiles. Jesus came so all that would 
experience the realm of God's presence and power. He came to open wide the kingdom. So why does Jesus say it's not right to take the children's bread? Well, Ken Bailey argues he's testing the disciples. As we said before, good teachers don't just disseminate information. Jesus has tried that approach, and it didn't work so well. The disciples need some remedial help. And so Jesus is deliberately drawing the disciples in. Jesus is forcing the disciples to face themselves. He is saying to them, do you want me to get rid of this woman? Do you want me to limit my ministry only to Israel? Do you want it to be us versus them? What Jesus is doing is giving voice to their beliefs. And then Jesus watches the disciples to see how they will respond. This is the master teacher at work. Will any of them speak up for this woman? Will any of them disagree? Will any of them say, wait, that's not right? Jesus is hoping someone will get it, but nobody does. Instead, the Israel, the disciples all nod their heads. They say, yes, you are right. Let's send her away. Let's get rid of her. Now we come to the hardest part of the test. What will the woman do? Will she leave? Because she could. She could just give up. She could just decide it's not worth the effort. She could conclude, I'm not going to win this strange tug of war. And yet her trust in Jesus is so profound, she keeps going. Her response is truly incredible. This is just an astonishing response. She says, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. What a bold and yet humble reply. She comes back at Jesus with both grit and grace. In fact, there's even an element of playfulness here. It's almost as if she is sparring with Jesus. What she's saying is, Go ahead, by all means, feed the kids. Certainly you should do that. But I bet you've got a crumb left over for me, even someone like me. This woman will not give up and go home. Why? Well, because she knows Jesus' heart even better than the disciples do. And she knows that Jesus will make room even for her. The disciples are watching all this and their jaws hit the floor. They have never in their lives seen anyone show such confidence with Jesus. They have ne never seen such a demonstration of courage and conviction. When they first see the woman, they think they are watching their moral inferior, someone who is not equal to them spiritually speaking. It turns out she is their master in every respect. She relates to Jesus on a level of understanding and humility and trust and boldness that simply puts them to shame. Now everybody looks at Jesus. The text doesn't say this, but I'll bet there's a grin on his face. Jesus is impressed. In fact, he is more impressed by this unnamed woman than just about anyone he meets in his entire ministry. And now the time has come and the grades are going to be given out. Jesus says, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And we're told instantly her daughter was healed. It turns out that the disciples, those who thought they were at the top of their class, get an F. And this unnamed Gentile woman gets an A+. Plus. I want to finish with this. You know, most groups are exclusive to some extent. Insiders want to separate themselves from outsiders, and we understand that when it comes to certain clubs or teams or organizations, but this tendency has no place in the church. Unfortunately, so often that's exactly what happens. And we say that we believe we are fundamentally defined by grace, but then our lives refute that. So we accept grace in theory, 
but we deny it in practice. We think surely salvation belongs to the proper and the pious, and we forget that Jesus came for the sinner, for the outcast. Jesus comes to proclaim the inbreaking of the kingdom. And this is what the church is all about. This is who we are. We are not a religious clique for the wealthy, the well-educated, the polite, or the respectable. We are not a club for preserving tradition or practices just because they make us feel comfortable or in control. We are a new community called into being through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might be God's instrument of reconciliation in a broken and hurting world. Friends, the grace that we have received in Christ places upon us the joyful gift and the challenging task of offering that same welcome that we have been given. May that be so even here. May we embody May we be marked by the generous, extravagant, limitless love of God. Let us pray. Lord, we see ourselves in the disciples in so many ways. We are such slow learners. Remind us again that we don't just believe in grace. We live by it. Help us to accept one another as you have accepted us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Christians, we are called to affirm our faith together wherever we are. So let us do so using the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, let us take the joys and concerns of our lives to God in prayer at this time. Merciful God, in this life we are blessed to walk with you. And yet today we are discomforted by encounters with the holy that challenge us and turn our expectations upside down. Lord, speak through such places of discomfort that we may grow we may grow more loving. 
speak to us in the words of a Samaritan woman that we might be more loving to our neighbors in this world. We pray for those who are pushed to the margins for their race, faith, belief, or perspective. Help your church to be outreach people, open to those around us that can help us learn and grow in our perspectives on who is inside or outside. So God, help us to be more inside-minded and invitational. Lord, speak to us in the silence that so many are experiencing, that we might find ways to care for the hurting in our community. We pray for those who are isolated or in need. We pray for those who are grieving or ill. Help those of us who are well or out and about to be caring and helpful people, open to hear the needs of our neighbors. Lord, help us to see those who are nearby and who desire human connection in this time. Lord, speak to us by inspiring us to serve and by giving us hope that we might remember your grace and seek to share it in our communities. Today we pray for our teachers and students who have returned to school in a whole new way, whether our friends and family return in person or virtually. We pray for kids and teachers in preschool and kindergarten, elementary school, middle and high schools and colleges and universities. Lord, we ask for patience, wisdom and safety for all who pursue or provide the gift of education this year. I give you thanks for the ways that you equip us with minds and encourage us to use them. God, in a spirit of faith in your promises made personal to us by your grace, help us to share in this world an abundant life and love for our church and for our neighbors. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who called us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This week we want to again highlight an area of service to our community through our church here at Trinity. Before school started, but as teachers returned, Trinity provided box lunches for teachers at Summerdale School and J. New Larry Newton Elementary just recently, and I know it was well received. As we continue to find ways to care for our neighbors, we are grateful for your support through prayer, time, imagination, and financial giving. May Trinity continue to be a place that seeks to love our neighbors through all times and all circumstances. Amen. Friends, not only do we believe in grace, we live by it. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.